I'm Dan Carell, CEO of the Digital Commerce Alliance, and this is Commerce Code, a bi-weekly digital commerce podcast for leaders in card linking, loyalty and digital marketing, mobile wallets and payments, and financial data. Thanks for joining this running conversation with leaders in the industry. And if you like this podcast, come join us at a Digital Commerce Alliance event. You can learn more at www.digcomall.org. This week, I'm talking with Kelly Hobbs and Laura Kelly from Value Dynamics. Value Dynamics describes itself as a leading global provider of curated, data driven, omni channel purchase rewards, which includes card linked offers, but Value Dynamics' expertise is expansive in the loyalty and rewards space. In fact, as we'll discuss in the conversation today, Value Dynamics is a Collinson business, and Collinson was one of the companies that created the modern practice of loyalty and rewards. Now, today I'm talking with Laura and Kelly about a study that Value Dynamics ran to understand consumer preferences and plans related to cash back versus points versus other kinds of rewards. And it gets into debit cards, credit cards, leather wallets, and, well, the fact that I'm 104. Uh, We'll talk about how AI might help tailor offers, points, and redemption paths for consumers. And, well, we'll talk a little bit about fantasy football, what the word football means, and a very brief pause to consider what sort of fantasy league I would be in if I did that sort of thing. All that and more in this episode of Commerce Code. Stay tuned for a conversation with Kelly and Laura and our deep dive into the mind of the consumer in 2023. Commerce Code is sponsored by Pentadata, the all-in-one financial data API. Whether it is bank account data, credit card transaction data, or credit reports and credit scores, Pentadata has it all in one simple and easy-to-use API. With coverage of over 6,000 banks, over 200 million credit files, and 60 million merchants, you can get all the data you need for your apps at pentadatainc.com. Laura and Kelly, thank you so much for joining us on Commerce Code. Uh, And Laura, we've been working with you at Value Dynamics for four or five years now. So welcome to Commerce Code. I think this is maybe the first time you've appeared on the actual show. Fun to be recording with you. And where are you joining us from? It is the first time I'm joining. So thank you for having me. And I am calling in from lovely Boston. Excellent. Well, that's great. Well, look, at Kelly, you are pretty new to Value Dynamics, I know. It's great to have you on Commerce Code, uh, also a first-timer, and you're not usually in Boston. In fact, you're so far from Boston that you and I had lunch a few weeks ago in the middle of the country, but where are you joining us from today? I am joining you from the Twin Cities of Minnesota. Outstanding. Well, look, Great to have both of you on the line. Totally excited for this conversation. And I want to start, Kelly, with you just because you have interesting background, interesting career, and you were attracted to this new role at Value Dynamics, leaving behind your your life of fame and fortune and the paparazzi and everything. So let me know, you know, like what was so compelling about what you're doing here? What are you excited about where you're headed with Value Dynamics? Yeah, it's been a really great time to join Value Dynamics. I've been here for about 90 days now. And what really drew me to the organization is, first and foremost, the Collinson Group legacy. So it's very interesting to be able to harness all of the legacy that's made up with Collinson Group of Priority Pass and airport dimensions with the airport lounges. And that just brings an extended value to what we do at Value Dynamics, which is allow shoppers to earn and redeem very easy and seamlessly every day. We're innovating. We're doing a lot of really cool things. So it's been a really fun time to come in. And I don't know if we've ever discussed on Commerce Code the sort of fascinating history of of Collinson and the airport lounges and sort of the creation of the very idea of airline loyalty, which, you know, we just, most of us just were born into a world or it felt like we were where that was just an established as if that had been around since the Wright brothers, right? Like it was just came with airplanes and that's not true, right? So Collinson was sort of instrumental in developing that. And then of course, the idea, you know, moves naturally into some adjacencies. And so Value Dynamics is about taking some of the kind of core competencies of what Collinson developed over decades and making that happen elsewhere. I, I don't know that we've ever talked about that before, but I, li- I like the fact that you allude to it because I think it's really interesting. So, you know, let me just ask this just to, to touch on one piece, and then we're going to jump into a study that you guys have done and some interesting findings, which is, you know, y- you, Kelly, have been at the intersection of rewards and payments for a long time. Like, kind of everything that you've done has in, in some way touched one or the other or both. 
And so with being at Value Dynamics and you've had 90 days to look around and, and, you, and you're in Boston, so I take it that you have not run away screaming, like all is well, um, every, everybody's, everybody's happy, like Boston is good. So what's sort of different about Value Dynamics and what they're doing there? I think the biggest thing is that we're able to power our clients with ways where they can really have the customer first, a customer first approach in what they're trying to do. And the most important thing is really being with the customer through their entire journey. So we've got ways to earn and ways to redeem. And I think that makes us pretty unique. I will editorialize for, you know, some people I think hear the words that you're saying and it makes total sense to them and they get it. And I think others maybe just based on their experiences wouldn't wouldn't know this, but I'll editorialize and say, the machinery of, of any industry and the machinery of payments is no different. Make it really hard to put the customer at the center of the enterprise, right? It's just really difficult. You know, it's like, imagine you're running General Motors, whatever. It's not easy to, you're, you're trying to put the car together, right? And that's a very complicated thing. It's hard to have the driver or the buyer or whatever, like at the center of everything you do. Uh, it's easy to lose the plot on that. And so uh, when you say those words, like, I get it, right? It's the complexity is is significant and keeping the customer center of mind and that customer experience and the loyalty experience and redemption and all the things we're about to talk about harder than it looks, but that's just my, that's just my two cents. You know, Laura, we're going to dive in on a study that you were involved in all along and, and want to get some comments and thoughts also from, from Kelly on this, but, uh, you know, value dynamics has done a pretty comprehensive study this year on consumers sort of perception and behavior relating to cash back rewards and payment channels, debit and credit, different credit card types, th this kind of stuff. We're not going to unpack the entire study here. It would just be a, a little too long for for our audience, I think, in the podcast. But I do want to hit some of the big picture stuff and then and and then just elicit some of the really interesting details. So let's just start, Laura, with what's the big picture of what the study is and why you guys did it. Yeah, definitely. So we did a study back in 2021. It actually concluded in January of 2021, and as we all remember, that is also when COVID started to hit. Mm. So. What we wanted to do, our perception of the market here in the U.S. is that, yes, cash is still a major driver for loyalty with both debit and credit cards, but we really wanted to test and make sure that we were correct. So we went back out and we, we asked questions, basically started with the same survey we had done in 2021 and then added some questions around consumer behavior for the next upcoming six months, year kind of area, just to see really, are they planning to shop more with credit cards, debit cards, cash, those different sorts of options. Unsurprisingly, more than 50% of consumers said, yes, cash back is still king, and that is the primary driver. So much so, that 58% of consumers said that they would even change their credit card and start using a new one if they had higher cashback opportunities with one over the other. So, you know, there was a lot of really good, like you're saying, information in the study. We do have an infographic that we're happy to share out with folks so that they can learn a little bit more. But the numbers really aligned with where we perceived they would. Am I right, just as an aside on, on process here, am I right that the study is probably available on, on your website somewhere at Value Dynamics or in some way like that? Yes, you're correct. I mean, we have an overview of it and we also have some additional content that people can interact with. So yes, please visit valuedynamics.com to find more information about the specifics of the study. It makes complete sense that consumers would be motivated by cash, like just in economic theory and, and whatever, however else you want to want to analyze it, but it's also been the, you know, the history of loyalty and rewards programs that they work in the world of proprietary points. And we'll get into maybe more of that in a minute. But I, I wonder, um, Kelly, as we're talking about cash back and sort of the main the main findings of the study, was there anything in this, the results of the study as you took a look at the thing that were a little bit different than what you've experienced in the past or something that was unexpected? I think I think the only thing that is a little bit different than the past is we're moving to a generation of what I'll refer to as power buyers with, you know, millennials and Gen Z are really driving how retail banking is reassessing their strategies. So a lot of the personalized experiences, 
payment modalities in how consumers can get their cash back. So is it push to debit? Is it PayPal Venmo? Are you getting it in the form of a gift card? So this is back to that mention of, you know, the consumer first approach. And that's where we're really honing in at Value Dynamics to ensure that our programs and our card linked offers and really everything that we do is in the spirit of personalization and just advancing that customer experience. You know, I wonder, and this would be for either of you, I guess, whether it's based on the study itself or whether it's just the experience that you've you've had around it or thoughts on it. You know, I'm still a leather wallet carrying dinosaur. Now I'm 104. Um, and so, you know, and, and it's podcast land, so nobody can, nobody can prove me wrong. Um, but I, I noticed like that my behavior. So when you say, for example, push to debit and that kind of stuff, my behavior probably resembles, I mean, gosh, my behavior probably isn't very different than my parents' behavior at my age in terms of overall, maybe like how I would use financial instruments, just basic consumer stuff. So then my question is, that's a lead up to saying, do you see either in the study or just in your business, significant age demographic differences, right? Between people's preferences and how they behave. I mean, you would think that we're, that's probably part of what's going on. I say most definitely. One of the things that we know, because we've read it in many studies and it's reflected here too, is that Gen Z tends to use debit cards over credit cards. And they are using them. They're not carrying cash in their leather wallets. I totally agree with that. They're probably using, you know, their Apple Pay and Google Pay, different opportunities there. But we definitely see a difference between debit card and credit card usage in Gen Z. Is that a thing that you expect to spread upwards or to change? Or is that pretty much a going to be a durable thing where so, so the, if the profile is, and I'm not 104, I'm 50, um, that the 50-year-old Dan Carell probably will continue his behavior? Or do you feel like that's likely to change down the line? I think it's probably likely to change down the line. I think, you know, adoption with, uh, you know, a certain generation may be slow, but it's definitely where technology is headed. I mean, there's an embedded finance boom. Embedded finance is a very hot topic that we're tuned into greatly in terms of embedded finance transforming the way consumers access and use financial services. And you see companies like Amazon, Airbnb, and Uber, for example, they're they're definitely leading the way in this type of disruption. So in, embedded finance, just in concept, creates a more seamless and convenient and personalized experience for users because they are integrating financial services into standard e-commerce platforms. So I think for, for the dance of the world that have their you know physical wallet in their back pocket, and people that just like to touch and feel their credit cards, I think truly much like physical plastic gift cards even, that will never go away really. But I think you're going to see a lot of e-commerce experiences and and retail banking experiences being much more of an omni-channel experience. And I'll even throw out the term gamification. That's something else that we're seeing a lot of in terms of banks and financial services organizations, they're, they're looking to build experiences that allow consumers to look at their app and their website as a lifestyle more than a utility. So that's really, that's really how things are changing is it's, it's more of a lifestyle and a destination to be able to take care of everything. So gamification really is kind of like the Netflix or the Spotify experience. You're doing these behaviors and you're performing these behaviors and through AI and other things, we know we know what you've done. So Value Dynamics, for example, has Offer Recommender where we're seeing your purchasing behaviors and we're seeing what you do. So we're going to be pushing offers that are most relevant to you. Absolutely. And I, you know, I, I'm going to come back and ask, ask you uh, kind of what's the most important thing. We're going to come back up to the highest level in the study. What's the most important thing you learned from the study? But just on the lifestyle point, you know, to me, a couple of comments, you know, one is it's probably true. It takes more or at least different circumstances to get a 50 year old dinosaur like creature to change their lifestyle, right? In some way, even in, in an incremental way. But by the way, it's not impossible, right? There was that minute, I don't know how many years ago now, when everybody's parents, i.e., people our age, so their parents being in their, at the time, 60s and 70s, got on Facebook, right? 
Now, this was sort of unimaginable for five years before it happened, but then it happened all in a wave. And so people can change their, you know, sort of behaviors in pretty meaningful ways and their, their, their lifestyles in, in some meaningful ways in almost any decade of life. If there's enough, I guess, social movement on it, that sort of like when the peer group moves, then they all move. And so it is totally believable to me that we all shift and that I may not carry around. I've always thought that an, a major inflection point will be when a, per, a typical person like me walks out the door, realizes that he or she doesn't have their wallet and kind of shrugs and goes, eh, doesn't matter that much. Like that's the point at which some of this stuff starts to change. But again, that's my two cents on it. I would, I, I'd be interested to come back at the, at the highest level and say, you know, you do the study and Laura, you were kind of a part of the architecture of that at the beginning. What do you think is the most important thing that you learned? Really looking at all of this, I was surprised at the high number of consumers who would both change their credit cards if they got a bigger, better offer, but also would change things like everyday merchants that they shop with because they have a new cashback offer, you know, whether it's on their credit card or their debit card for maybe the competitor next door. Right. I think about to go back to analogies with our, our you know, grandparents. My grandmother used to sit with all of the grocery flyers from all of the grocery stores in the nearby towns and look for the best offers. I feel like we have moved away from flyers. I mean, most grocery stores themselves are starting to move away from them. But people are using these offers. They're looking at their credit cards and their debit cards before they go shop. And that's, again, a very high percent of people. It's, you know, in the almost 60 percent are doing it before they go shop and they will change. So there's no true loyalty that is there that can't be shaken a little bit with the right offer. So true. You know, I I know that my my mom went to like at least two, probably three different grocery stores on a normal trip. I slash we have three. And the question of what, and like there's an anchor product that you're there to get for each of the three that isn't available in the other ones or is just significantly cheaper. But then the question of whether you just stick around and go ahead and buy the rest of the basket there too is going to depend on offer stuff. And so you can really inflect, and it's possible for one of those stops to just disappear, you know, for, for any of a variety of reasons. And so the stuff is in play, right? It's highly competitive. Exactly, exactly. And it's a real opportunity for both card issuers and for merchants, right? So here at Value Dynamics, we look at both sides of the ecosystem and we're seeing this and and it's real information that merchants and credit issuers can use uh, when they're thinking about how they're going to try to entice consumers to come shop with them or to come use their card and to continue doing that. At the level of the overall study, just thinking about it, one last big, bigger picture question, which is, was there anything sort of counterintuitive in there? You've talked a little bit about you know, people's willingness to, to switch. Um, so maybe it was that. I don't think it would be counterintuitive that folks were saying, hey, cash is, is a good thing and maybe a, the highest good just because it's most fungible and, and flexible. But was there anything in there that you saw that you would kind of draw out as, huh, wasn't expecting that? Not so much that I wasn't expecting, but it was confirmed that there are very few debit cards that have cashback offers, but people are shopping with those cards. So that really opens the door for local banks, credit unions, even card issuers at the bigger banks to think about how they're engaging consumers who are primarily using their debit cards to shop how they can better entice them to use their card instead of someone else's. Or when we start thinking about Gen Z and some of those kids are still in high school and and starting to graduate and get their own debit and credit cards, how can they actually engage with them and encourage them to open it with their institution? This is just as a a note on what the thing is. It's U.S. I mean, I read the study, but it's U.S. consumers, right? So this is in the United States? This is U.S. consumers, yes. So in the debit card thing, I'm really interested in this is maybe calls for speculation a bit, but Kelly or Laura, either of you. So if we're doing cash back on a debit card and interchange fees being different for debit cards, and it depends on the country, that's why I asked the question. Wait, what's going on there, do you think? And like, do you, if you know, and and what do you think the, the amount of cash back is? Because there's also a, to me, and it may differ, and this is where studies actually have a lot of value, right? Like 
how much are people motivated by X amount of cash back, right? I, I'll tell you personally, I, I get motivated by cash back when I start to see it accumulate and I've seen it in action. Um, when I see like a percentage, I guess I just think to myself, well, that seems like a really small amount. But then of course you see it accumulate and you go, oh, that's really cool. I can buy a whole whatever, fill in the blank with it. So it changes your attitude. But I mean, what do you think is going on with debit card cash back? How much is it and how's it getting funded? I'm not sure really about the debit card piece, but what you were just talking about reminds me of my my last several years um, working with the large financial institutions. And, you know, we, we all laugh with them because they've done a phenomenal job of training the customer to go to cash back first. It's just kind of a reflex, honestly, because it's so easy. You can get it as a statement credit or, you know, there, there's a couple of ways that you as a consumer can get that cash back. But but maybe to your earlier point that you alluded to, I think the big difference through our lens at Value Dynamics is there's no emotional tie to cash back. And so that's where we see, you know, travel rewards and more aspirational types of goals for consumers. While cash back is definitely king, We are seeing consumers move to ways, whether that's through a credit card or perhaps a debit card, they're looking for ways to have that emotional tie to say, hey, I just burned my points for this and I'll be talking about it for the next five years. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. And I'm, I'm sitting here thinking that surely that there are at least a few folks either in the fields of psychology or economics, but really at the intersection of those that have written their dissertations or maybe master's theses on Strictly speaking, is consumer behavior rational when you're in the world of points as opposed to when you're in the world of dollars, right, or cash? Because I think it's true and it has always been in a way the goal that if you're into a brand or maybe if you become interested in a brand in a way because of a loyalty program like this, that, you know, you might you end up valuing those points and the the objective of getting to a certain level, right, so that you can have a thing or do a thing. That, you know, honestly, if you were to do the math on it, you'd say, look, you've spent more energy and effort on this than you could have just bought it for money, you know, but that you don't value it the same way. Like you value it more because there's a point system and there's a brand association and there's something I think it is really about scarcity, right? At some level, which is that, I mean, yes, cash is scarce, obviously, to a certain extent, but like points are unique and scarce, you know? And this was the theory behind NFTs, by the way, and I shouldn't put it in the past tense because there's, I think we're all still trying to figure out whether and how that thing happens. But there's this idea that we're attached to, and I've certainly behaved this way before, right? Where you, you know, I used to travel like crazy and you're, you're looking at the statements going like, hey, if I can get like, you know, X thousand miles before the end of the year. I never did this myself, but I have friends who literally did a round trip across country back and forth only so that they could get to, right, a certain status level or whatever it was. And so that's the kind of be incremental behavior, right, that has maybe been the dream all along. And it feels like with cashback, the challenge is how can you drive that incremental behavior? One of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about here and just having looked at the study again is where do you think the future of loyalty programs go in light of what we've learned here and what we kind of know as we sit in the nearing the end of 2023 in travel, maybe in financial and other areas. So again, let me just kind of put that to, to either of you to dive in on future of loyalty programs. Yeah, I think a couple of things that come to mind for me, the definition of loyalty is very different for a couple of generations, which are, are Gen Z and millennials. So we have done a lot of research and the research isn't unique to us necessarily, but just if anyone does enough research, they will find that, and I have two teenagers, by the way, they are loyal until they're not loyal anymore. So it used to be like, okay, my mom would do the laundry and she used Tide. So I still use Tide. I'm loyal to that. The smell of it, you know, takes me back to a lot of memories. And, you know, there, there's a very big emotional tie there. When you look at millennials and Gen Z, their loyalty is in, you know, if they're signing up for a credit card or the decisions that they're making is they're looking at what's the social impact of the company? Does the company treat their employees well? You know, are they eco-friendly? It's it's just a very different narrative with loyalty with these generations. And I think, you know, the second thing is in terms of travel, if we look at travel, I've traveled a lot for work, and at one point I was platinum on Delta. But if I was flying to San Francisco, 
I was not upgraded. It would be rare to get an upgrade. And so I think one thing that has changed in travel loyalty is that earning is easier. I think travel and hospitality, whether it's, you know, hotel chains or airlines, we're also finding that earning is becoming easier for reasons like I described in terms of you know, airlines and loyalty programs are allowing members to customize the perks they receive. You know, it's a, it's a big plus for people who don't travel as often. So programs are, are adding bonus perks or, again, gamification to really incent achieving status levels and, and keeping those levels within reach. So the hundred times that you didn't get upgraded on that flight to San Francisco in all likelihood, it's a, almost a statistical probability that I was the guy who also didn't get upgraded and was jammed into the middle seat next to you. But, you know, we didn't chat because especially under those circumstances, I just keep my head down and try and you know get things done on my iPad or whatever. Or maybe I'm engaged in the gamification of some loyalty program uh, there. But yeah, I, I feel your pain on not quite being. Um, there's a great Frasier episode, by the way, about um, like getting into the next room or something in a club. And so if you were platinum, as anyone in Delta world knows, alas, you were not diamond. You could find me in the coach class in a middle seat with my alligator arms yeah. typing on my laptop. Yes, 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 exactly. That's when yeah, I know I always wish that I had like smaller shoulders or something. OK, so um, I love the and we, you've mentioned gamification a couple of times. And I, I'm very interested in that because it seems like there's terrific possibilities there. And, you know, what's what's also fun to realize about, you know, the human condition, I guess, or experiences. We've got little rectangular devices in our hands always now that, you know, have, as everybody knows, multiples more computing power than than it took to get Apollo to the moon. And yet. I don't know that anything on one of those devices has yet surpassed the old McDonald's Monopoly game, you know, where you had the little the little Monopoly board and the McDonald's stuff and you went and, you know, to me, it drove a lot of behavior. So it feels like it's coming, right? Like there's someone's going to crack it. And there's a lot of different you know, ways that this can happen. The possibilities are so much more r rich, you know, in terms of what could happen in that space. And so I still think that, you know, that gamification, like so many things in this sector, we're still in the the time before whatever the big thing is that makes it truly awesome. And I, I wonder, I wonder where you think that that's, you know, I could be, I mean, it could be in any industry too, right? Where that happens. I just wonder wh where you think you've seen the coolest stuff in gamification. I actually saw a really cool example of gamification that Collinson helped a client with. And it was one where members could bid on different, I'm going to use the European term, different football jerseys and other equipment pieces, ultimately leading all the way up to tickets. And so this would really hit with the right group, right? The right target audience. And they could bid on different pieces. They could, uh, you know, join in and use their currency to actually try to win one of these pieces. I just think it's really important that you understand who your audience is and what is going to motivate them. So gamification for gamification's sake isn't going to work, but knowing that you have a lot of customers who love football, that's gonna resonate and that's gonna really drive a lot of fun and a lot of engagement and loyalty. Yeah, it's, to echo that point, or maybe put it in different words, I mean, it's ne it's n it's never just form, and it's never just substance, right? You have the greatest substance in the world, but if the form stinks, uh, and vice versa. But you know, you combine the right substance here, it's football, with just the right form, and it can be just right, uh, absolutely terrific exactly. in terms of outcome. And there's every reason to think that. I mean, it's amazing, you know. I I um one of my one of my maxims that I repeat to my kids is look whenever you think you know it, uh, this is a little bit stereotypical but whenever you know if you think if you think a guy's dumb ask him about his fantasy football team right I have the personal view that people aren't dumb they just aren't and it depends on what they're interested in right like what are they interested in and then you're going to discover that pretty much everybody is quite smart and so that's a way of thinking about that like do they want to gamify it like is it you know because my I'll right. just in my case I. I don't understand, have never tried, and probably wouldn't fantasy football, but that's not my thing. So, right, but you got to find like, where's your segment? Where's your customer? And then football, to your point, whatever kind of football does it for really significant demographic groups, right? It does. You know, you brought up NFTs. That's something that is really going to resonate with a group of people. Cryptocurrencies will resonate. So it's thinking about, what do I want to invest in? What's going to actually move the needle? 
but really always bringing it back to your consumer and better understanding what it is that they actually want, not what you hope they want, but doing your research, talking to folks, better understanding, and then designing your program to match. That's the need for you know consumer research and the kind of work that you guys have, have been doing. I want to call for some rank speculation here at the end of the podcast. If I don't somehow get you in trouble in a way, in the sense that you've predicted something that you know either could or couldn't happen, I'm, I'm doing it wrong. And so we're looking forward, you know, it's almost 2024. 2025 sounds like science fiction to me. Now, 20, 2000 sounded like science fiction to all of us. So, you know, there you go. But um, we're almost a quarter of the way through uh, this century and... I am just interested to get your conjecture, and maybe we can start with Kelly and then go to Laura. How do you think consumers and payments are going to be different as we get 16 months from now into uh, 2025? Um, Go. (laughs) Yeah, I think we will continue to see that AI will continue to be a very hot topic. And to my earlier mention, retail banking is they're in the midst of reassessing how they're engaging with customers. So I think you're going to see kind of a a redefining of the loyalty landscape with the ability to move to a much deeper level of personalization by analyzing customer behaviors and taking data to tailor rewards and promotions in a a very different way. I was just reading a pretty intense study about, well, trended consumer data analysis, but really it was about, you know, if you look at consumer behavior as opposed to characteristics, then you can you can know more about what their you know past behavior predicts future behavior, at least for humans, if not the stock market. And yet it takes a lot of human brain power or computational power or whatever to be able to do that. So I think, you know, AI has a lot of power there for being able to do offer recommendations on an on a mass scale, you know, automated basis, right? Because they can see to the extent that the data is available, it can see my behavior and then can see that I would be motivated by a certain thing. It could see that I'm not a fantasy football person, but in fact, they might be able to get me involved in something enormously more nerdy than that. Uh, and then I'm and then I'm there, right? So Laura, I'll come to you. Again, also curious about how we think about consumers, payments, and how Value Dynamics is interacting with the marketplace in the next 16 months, where do you sort of see things headed in the program that you're putting together as we come up to 2025? I think it's all about relevancy and really thinking about how do we present, if this is you know very often used, but the right offer to the right person at the right time. It's really moving from using terms like AI to better understanding what that actually means in practice so that we can help programs, we can help merchants become more relevant and stickier to their consumers. But yeah, that's really where I'm thinking is around offer recommenders and again, the right offer to the right person at the right time. To dovetail that, having the ability to take a look at customer segments and you know, we're in a position to really be prescriptive and in, in with our clients and help them identify strategies for first movers and high spenders and deal seekers. So we work with financial institutions and they have very unique card portfolios where you've got affluent cardholders that like dining and travel. That's going to be a very different type of offer and promotion and approach than deal seekers or high spenders. So we're in a position from, you know, even from a categorization standpoint or a a segmentation standpoint to really bring a lot of value there. Agreed. You know, we're still, even as things have continued to evolve, like there's still an enormous part of the market that is on a pretty conventional looking in some way, earn to redeem pathway, right? Like I'm, we're all on some of those somewhere in different programs, different things. So the offer tailoring or matching that can happen better with AI is, you know, a development of possibility, getting us on the right pathway there. And, you know, then we're building value. And we know that there's a, a, a lot of interest in cashback, but there's still a ton of interest in reward currency, right? That can be redeemed in certain categories. I assume that that's still part of this, the strategy there in value dynamics as well. 
Yes, definitely. When we look at millennials, again, you know, this this generation of power buyers, you know, back to, to travel loyalty, they are looking for ways to cut costs and they want to use points to be able to do that. So the fact that, again, earning is easier this year in 2023, half of Americans will plan to do more traveling this year than last year. So offers and the things that we're talking about are very relevant. Now that the dust has settled from COVID, travel is coming back, things are on a good path now. We see trends that suggest that there will be a lot of point burn, um, especially in travel. Just looking at airports and you know, anybody who's been on an airplane lately, which is a lot of people, apparently, uh, I think everybody can see that that's going on. I, I got to say, when we were just coming into what we were calling sort of revenge travel last year, I thought, OK, that this will work its way out and then things will stabilize. But uh, I've seen both some reports, but maybe just with my own two eyes walking through airports at good evidence that this is going to be a long term trend. People want to travel I don't think it's just post COVID. It's there's just a lot of action there. And anyway, good news for hotel chains and Boeing and Airbus and everybody else that's involved. Absolutely. Well, look, uh, thank you so much for joining us today, talking about the study, unpacking some of the details again, uh, available on the Value Dynamics website. You can get into the get into the details. And uh, Kelly, welcome to both Commerce Code and uh, Digital Commerce Alliance and of course, Value Dynamics. And Laura, thanks again for being a part of yet another episode of Commerce Code. Thank you for thank having you. us. Commerce Code is brought to you in part by Vantage Score. Nine of the top 10 banks and over 3,000 leading banks and fintechs use Vantage Score to predict and manage repayment risk. Learn more about the latest advances in credit scoring and how to grow your lending business by leveraging financial inclusion at VantageScore.com. Commerce Code is a bi weekly podcast bringing you conversations with executives who are leading the way in digital commerce. If you like Commerce Code, your company should join the Digital Commerce Alliance and become part of our mission of advancing trade for good through standard setting, industry networking, conferences, and best practice sharing. Check out our website at www.digcomall.org. On behalf of DCA, have a great week. <laughs>